There were four major groupings, if you will, over the history of neurotic gumbo that are important. I mean, there are currently nine members in the band. Uh, over the years, there were 11 other musicians that came and went through neurotic gumbo, four of which really didn't spend much time with the band, but the seven that are no longer with us were a critical part of the history of, if you will, the four separate groupings that really has been neurotic gumbo over the years. February 9th, 1964, the Ed Sullivan Show, the Beatles stormed America. I was 12 years old and I decided maybe it's time to learn how to play guitar. And it all starts back in high school. I went to parochial school in seventh grade. I had a band, but we couldn't even tune. I didn't even know what we were doing. And every band member's last name ended in a vowel, if you will. And so I went to uh, public school and I saw this band, the henchmen, and these guys could bar chords, new steps, sang harmonies, tune their guitars. And I said, wow, I don't even know what, how to run a band I, and there might be in a band. A friend of mine said, geez, the, the lead guitar player, it happened to be Paul O'Bara, was leaving to join a, a college band and they're looking for a guitar player. And they said, show up at Teen Town and they're gonna ask you to join the band. And Teen Town was the uh, weekly dance for junior high, TAG was the, the weekly uh, dance for high school uh, students. And so I showed up with my little turtleneck dicky V-neck sweater and white socks. All of a sudden, here comes this guy, Buzz Berger, with his entourage and Bobby Comiskey and said, you know, are you interested in joining the band? They said, can you do steps? I lied and said yes. They said, can you bar chords? I told the truth and said yes. And they said, and Buzz said, okay, practice Monday at Bobby's and I never want to see those white socks again. That March, we, we did a talent show at the high school, and we placed third, which gave us a chance to perform on community auditions. Uh, but we went on, we played Midnight Hour, and won. Years later, come to find out, the way they picked a winner, they just stacked the cards. And uh, we went down to Buzz's house and started filling out postcards, got the phone book out, and we sent in more postcards than anybody. And we didn't win the semifinals because we didn't bother. In the meantime, Paul O'Bara, who quit, was tired of playing and staying out nights with the college band, wanted to come back. Well, we already had two guitar players, so what were we gonna do with another guitar player? But Bobby Comiskey and Buzz said, well, we gotta keep Artie because he's the glue. We finished up in high school, and then in the late 80s, we got together just to play around, and the whole idea we said, why don't we do a gig? Everybody knew we were practicing, let's do a gig. We all turned 40 next year, let's do a 4-0 gig. And we filled the Italian Center, we had a blast. It was a lot of fun. And then we kind of, after that, kept moping around, thinking what to do. And then in 94, we did another show, we called it the Farewell Tour. We kind of sort of made it like we had been on world tour and now we're coming home for one final concert. And it was great. I mean, the original high school band was Stan Harris on vocals, uh, Buzz Berger on bass, Paul O'Bara guitar, Bobby Comiskey on drums, and myself on rhythm guitar. And it was so successful, again, we decided, let's start playing out somewhere. And Stan had been working with a gentleman by the name of Kenny Brown, who played keyboards. Stan would occasionally play keyboards, but he brought Kenny Brown in. This is still the high school band plus Kenny Brown. Buzz, Paul, Bobby, me, and Stan. You know, they would call it the proto band. Gretchen has a word for that. My wife has a word for something, or the er, it's called in mythology. What was the first? Before we even did that first gig, Bobby Comiskey, who TV director, I've known him since ninth grade, just didn't have the time for it because he was directing Chronicle. So another good friend of mine, Donnie Kirby, joined the band. Now I met Donnie in ninth grade. Who knows? I somehow was attracted to drumming. We played our first gig in August of 1994 at the Sitting Bull Pub in Maynard. And we had to come up with a name. So 
After much bantering back and forth, Kenny Brown came up with the name Neurotic Gumbo, largely because he had spent at least a year with the band and how neurotic we really are. There was plenty of neuroses to go around among us all. And Gumbo, again, was for the different types of music we could play, you know, shuffle, blues. We used to start with uh, Manic Depression. Who starts in a set with Manic Depression? But that's just an indication. And we go from there to some great blues tunes. Uh, we even played Dixie Chicken and so on and so forth. And that's where the name, at least, Neurotic Gumbo came from. Kenny lasted about a year, and then he had decided he had had enough and had to move on to other things, and we invited Mark Marquis into the band. And so that was a real treat. Mark played uh, keyboards, and then a few years later, I bought a Hammond B3, and he started playing that also with the band. One of my favorite stories about uh, Mark being in the band, uh, Buzz was always nervous about what Mark thought about what we were going to play or whatever, and we were going to play Vehicle. Uh, we still play it. Uh, in fact, it's on, on the video. And uh, I remember Buzz turning to Mark and going, Mark, I, I bet you this is something you never played. He says, I would never play this song except for Neurotic Gumbo. And he said, and it'll be better because of it. In the fall of 98, we had a bit of a crisis because Paul O'Bara, one of the original henchmen and the one that had left the henchmen to find a place for me, had to leave the band. And so at the time, I had become friends with Al Redstone. He did sound for us. And his wife, Diane, was quite an accomplished guitar player. And Stan and I thought we should invite her into the band. But I had to first ask her husband's permission, which uh, to this day, she was gonna join the band anyway, Al. a year until Stan Harris passed away in November of 1999. We were going to be the opening band for Andy Rome's place downtown. And I remember setting up, and Stan was never late for setting up. So I said, geez, where's Stan? He must still be trying to get that job done. And so Donnie Kirby and I went over to the shop, and there he was on the ground. Massive heart attack. And of course, losing Stan, that was the vocal up front. I don't care what you say about any band. If you don't have a good lead vocalist, you don't have a band. And so we had to look for vocalists. And the first vocalist to take his place was Laurie Babineau. Now, Laurie didn't stay long with us, about a year and a half, and I was going through some different things, and the band, this is 2001, we really weren't active much, and Laurie bowed out. And my good friend and dear friend, who uh, was a real friend of the band, Ed Cormier, knew a 
uh, a great blues singer called Kevin Haney. And so we auditioned Kevin for the band, and he could really sing the blues. And at that point, Mark and Donnie decided to leave the band. Uh, so now I need a drummer, and I need a keyboard player. Well, lo and behold, Bobby Comiskey became a independent director. He had time on his hands. So now Bobby comes in for a second stint. Liquid, where we had played, one of the guys that did sound there was John Shula. And I remember every time we used to set up, he would say, oh, can I just sit in with you guys at sound check? Because Mark occasionally couldn't make sound check or whatever. Now, I heard of John over the years, great keyboard player, local guy, but he always wanted to sit in with us when we played. And so we asked John to join the band. And frankly, that was 2001. He's been with me the longest, 20 years now. So that was a short-lived, uh, if you will, iteration. Uh, what had happened was, is we were trying to expand what we were playing, but Kevin, the lead singer, really had a limited range. And uh, through a substitution one night, he couldn't make a gig, Scott Babineau filled in. And Scott was enamored and said, if you ever need me, I'll join the band. And now that really opened up the different kind of songs we could do. We were doing Tom Petty. Uh, we were doing a lot of different things, Steely Dan. Uh, it really was a, a, a big opening. Buzz in summer of 2003 just felt he couldn't spend enough time with the band and felt that we were moving beyond his capabilities. It was difficult to see Buzz leave. He was the founding member of the band. Actually, Bobby and Buzz's backyards touched each other, and that's where the band really started. And Buzz's personality, you just had to know him. He was sometimes larger than life, always had a smile, and always had a quip, and something clever to say. But he still kept in touch with the band. He always came to practices, came to all our gigs, uh, really loved the band, and never really stopped supporting us. Uh, unfortunately, our good friend Buzz passed away in uh, 2018. We miss him dearly because if there was a spirit and a soul of neurotic gumbo way back to the henchmen from the beginning, and still today, it's Buzz, Willie Ray Berger. Love you, Buzz. So Scott took over bass duties and singing. This is in 2003. Well, it turns out that that year end, Scott had said, uh, I think I've got to move on. I've had enough. I now don't have a singer, and I don't have a bass player. What am I going to do? Well, lo and behold, we found from Method, as we call it, Method, a gentleman by the name of Ernie Cataldo. connection with Ernie was back in the late 70s, he worked at EU Wurlitzer's in Boston, the big music store right next to Berkeley. And Diane Redstone used to do guitar repairs there, and Ernie was the keyboard expert. He happened to move to Lemonster. Diane ran into him. He was running a shop down in Searstown called 89th Key and said, would you like to try out for the band? He came to see us a few times and was surprised at the different kinds of things we played. 
And then Mark had suggested uh, a bass player named Greg Ristaban, uh, who's fairly well known around. He has played with a lot of different bands, uh, worked at Cornerstones, uh, and also the, I forgot the name of the restaurant in Fitchburg back then. So he was well known in the area. And so he came to try out, and then it was just magic. With Bobby on drums, Diane Redstone on guitar, Greg Ristovan, who's been a real uh, pleasure to work with all these years, John Shula, Ernie, and myself. That became, if you will, iteration neurotic gumbo number three. <laughs> first band that we got to play at Hampton Beach in 2006. All of a sudden we were doing these big production numbers, doing Won't Get Fooled Again, Bob O'Reilly. These are the songs we love to play. And this band really was dramatic. And Hampton Beach has become our gig that we work toward all year because of the response that we get. Now a good number of people will come up to see us that know us. But there are always a lot of people that don't know who we are. And to get the kind of reaction we get where people are standing up on the bleachers with their phones, like the old days with cigarette lighters, and they're coming up and dancing and they're giving us wild cheers, you can't replace it. You just can't replace it. It's like, you know, Paul McCartney and the Rolling Stones, they're still playing. They don't have to do anything. They got all the money in the world to do anything they want. What do they want most? It's that connection with an audience. Hey, yeah! The gentleman that got us the gig at Hampton Beach was one remarkable individual personality and musician, Stevie Ciccolini. I'll be forever grateful that we got to play and still play at Hampton Beach. He was just positive and the guy who ran Hampton Beach said, if, if Chicky vouches for you, you're good enough for me. Something that both of us have always 
to this day still becomes our biggest gig of the summer. And then in 2008, we were thrilled. We were ready to premiere I Am The Walrus. We had worked out an arrangement that was gonna kill everybody. At 10 minutes of seven before we went on, the skies opened up. We got sand everywhere, the winds came. A tornado had touched down in Exeter that night. That's how bad the storm was. And then in 2009, we had another dramatic event. Diane had to move on. Frankly, she got tired of the boys fighting all the time. And uh, there were just disagreements with Bobby in terms of the direction of where the band should go. And so now I don't have a lead guitar player, I don't have a, a drummer all over again. There was a slight makeup when uh, Bob and Diane left the band. We had to find a guitar player and a drummer. Everybody knows Eddie Kelly and the Kelly family, I, uh, and he's been close friends with John since junior high. It's kind of like me and Bobby and Donnie. Uh, and it was just easy to ask Ed if he wanted to join the band. Just such an accomplished drummer, uh, amenable, uh, willing to take on anything. And so, again, it was easy to find a drummer. And then for lead guitar player, uh, I had opened up the shop here where we had music lessons and hired Al Gerard. Now, Al Gerard is kind of known as the mayor around town in terms of uh, musicians that know him because he's worked in music stores his whole life. And he's played in a whole bunch of bands over the years. And we asked Al if he'd be interested in joining uh, the band. You know, he had a whole new repertoire of songs. It was, it was great, you know, to have somebody that was bringing in sort of new enthusiasm. That lasted about a year and a half until something big happened to Neurotic Gumbo. 
That year, Jerry Sabatini, quite an accomplished jazz trumpeter known throughout New England, up and down the East Coast actually, asked if he could use my facility for a summer project, it was sort of a jazz workshop. And I said, sure. He said, no charge, Jerry. He says, well, if there's anything I can ever do for you, Artie, let me know. And I said, Jerry, there is. I always wanted to play with a horn section. So we talked about oh, maybe we could just do one gig, and I said, I want Rick Stepton, a local legend, trombonist, and Jerry said, great. He said, I got a great young sax player, Bill Jones. So we learned a set of songs, and we played at the Elks. The, the six of us came out, played a set, then the horns came and played the second set, and we had about 280 people there. They went crazy because they, we've had a following all these years from the Neurotic Gumbo, but this was so different and so dramatic, and it was so much fun because now we could play songs that we always wanted to play, Chicago, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Joe Cocker, so many horn songs that, that, that just add so much color and sonority to the band. And the horns had so much fun, they said, you know, when's your next gig? And I said, we play the F Troop Christmas Party. And they said, we'll play it if you want. And sure enough, once they played that, they said, we'll become permanent members of the band if you want. And then we became a nine-piece horn band, Neurotic Gumbo, our current iteration. And it's been just a joy. It's it's been so different. We became more of a not not like a performance band like the last uh, group of musicians, but more we wanted to see people get up and dance. So not that we became a part. We still do production numbers. You can just take any Chicago tune; it's a production number. Uh, but it's more geared toward how's the audience going to react to this rather than I, we want to play this. We don't care what the audience thinks. And it's been so much fun. And my favorite story from Rick Stepton, when they first came in, Ernie turned to the horn players and said, look at you guys. You went to Berkeley, New England Conservatory. Uh, you play great jazz. You can sight read anything. You write music. Rick, you traveled with Buddy Rich. He said, now you're playing with a bunch of old rock and rollers. Rick said, well, if you guys were real musicians, we would have been done an hour ago. So, and it's been a real joy. Uh, Rick just turned 79, and he self-proclaims that he's the oldest rock and roll trombonist in America. Uh, and of course, if you know anything about music in Chicago, James Pankow wrote all the uh, uh, horn charts for Chicago when he was he was a trombonist. So Rick, he says he's only 75, I'm 79, so I'm the oldest rock and roll trom trombone player in America. And Bill Jones is just fabulous. A lot of the work falls on Jerry because he writes the chats for the horns, he directs the horn section, he does a lot of times directs the band depending on transition endings or whatever, and then he's got to play all these crazy trumpet parts. So he has become a real joy to work for, and what he contributes to the horn section and the whole sound of Narada Gumbo is quite amazing.
adding the horns wasn't just to play horn songs, again, because we had such great talent among those three jazz horn players. Uh, Jerry always approaches a song and said, I'd love to write a horn chart for that. For example, uh, he always wanted to write a horn chart to mimic a Jimi Hendrix solo, which we do on Foxy Lady. We've added horns to I Am the Walrus, which you wouldn't expect. Uh, he, he's able to mimic the bagpipes, and it's a long way to the top uh, by ACDC. So it's not just we play horn songs. We add horn songs to songs you wouldn't think had horns to them. I mean, we play, obviously, you know, the, the classic horn songs that, that people know and remember. So it, it's a broader palette, if you will, than just getting a song and say, okay, this is a horn song. It's, well, he, he wrote a great arrangement for Don't Let the Sun Catch a Crying, which nobody, he had heard somebody do a version of it and said, I always wanted to write a chart for that. So one of the fun things about Gumbo, and you got to look at the three horn plays and then the other six, uh, and I call the other six the senile six, okay? And it takes us two or three practices to learn a new song. Uh, and then if we've got it down, I'll call Jerry. Jerry, can you write a chart for this song? The horns come in, they know it. And we might have to tweak an ending or a transition or a solo. But it, it, that's interesting, and it's been fun over the last eight years that we learn music much different than the way the horns learn music. But then it comes out as a whole as, as really jiving together and creating a great sound and a great groove. It's just been, it's just been a lot of fun. Thank <laughs> you. 
have our favorites, okay? Uh, as I said, uh, basically, Greg, John, Ed, uh, me, and Ernie, we're all overlap the same period. Al came later, because he's younger. Uh, I mean, frankly, I hate to say this, but we got four guys in the band that are 70 years or older, and Al's 10, 11 years younger. But he's, he knows the music, because he's been in it for so long. Uh, that you know, he he can pick up anything that 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 we might want from the classic rock era, and that's why Ernie came up with the last gig we played. He said, "I got a great song. We had to do Sweet Child of Mine." I said, "Guns and Roses, really?" He says, "Oh yeah, we'll stun everybody. Nobody will expect us to come up with that." I said, "Well, that song's over 25 years old anyway, for crying out loud. It's not like we're doing current or new material." So it's just a mishmash of how we figure out what we want. Do we need a slow song? We, we, need, we need a danceable song. Let's do this as a production number. We don't care if they don't dance for it because we like playing it. Okay, so it really is a lot of disparate ideas and compromises when we finally decide to uh, pick a song, if you will. <laughs>
one of the interesting things was is that, and we all took to it. This sometimes this just happens by magic. Uh, Ernie came in once and said, "I want to do uh, change is going to come." Now I always loved Sam Cooke. I, I might have suggested that song years and years ago, but Ernie said, "I just heard a version of it. I want to sing it," and we all said, "Wow, great song." And so, you know, we added horns to it, and we put a sax solo in it, if you will, we repeated the bridge twice, and uh, had a lot of fun with it. So sometimes things just magically work like that. Other times we'll try something and say, this just isn't going to work. I was born. Not a lead guitar player, never was, never could be. I just enjoy being part of something beyond myself. I mean, way back when, this goes to junior high, high school days. I didn't play sports. The band was my male bonding experience, if you will. And I think today it's the same way. The the six of us get together, obviously more regularly than the horns, and we become good close friends. And so we'll argue sports, we'll argue politics, we'll drink, and we'll play music. And so it's 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 sort of not it's sort of current to say boys' club, but that's essentially what we are. And so there's a joy in that, even if we have disagreements about you played the wrong part. No, it's supposed to be this chord or that chord, or that's the way it should end. I got a better beginning. Uh, last night was the first time we practiced since, since since the fall because of the the virus, and John wanted to come up with a new opening to Born to Run, and everybody said, Ah, leave it alone, do that, leave it alone. And finally, I think it was either Al or Greg said, It'll take two seconds to try it. Turns out. It was a great improvement.
sweated out on the streets of a runaway American dream. At night we ride through mansions of glory in a suicide machine. Sprung from cages out on Highway 9, cool wheel fuel injected and stepping out over the line. Whoa! A lot of people ask, how long do you go on with this? Uh, tough to say. Uh, as long as we still enjoy this, the joy is we're doing something that we did as kids uh, and to just get together. I think if something happened to, to one of us, uh, the horn section, uh, the, the critical key player in the horn section is, is Jerry. Uh, in fact, over the years, we've had substitutes for uh, all three of them at spe excuse me, specific gigs. Again, the charts are there. You, you call someone else up to read the charts, but he'd be difficult to, to uh, replace in the horn section. As far as the Senile Six go, okay, uh, they're going to kill me for referring us to the Senile Six, but the, you know, again, it's John, Greg, Ed, myself, Ernie, and Al. When you change one person in the band, the band changes. That was our experience way back when. At first, when Donnie Kirby replaced Bobby and Mark came in the band, and then Stan passed away, we had to replace Paul. And Diane came in uh, with Kevin and uh, Laurie and Scott on vocals. A band changes. It takes a while to work out how all the pieces are going to fit. So if you took out one of the six of us, I don't know what would happen. I will tell you that there is one irreplaceable person, and that's Ernie. Uh, if you don't have a lead singer, you don't have a band, and we're just so fortunate that he's willing to tackle all the material we tackle. I don't know where I could find a replacement for Ernie. And of course, I know Ernie's going to say, well, why don't you start paying me more? But OK, Ernie, all right, <laughs> we got that covered. But, and it would be hard, I think, for any, any of us at this point uh, if one of us had to leave. I mean, we've been fortunate that we've been together for eight years. So again, because it's been the longest uh, grouping, if you will, of Neurotic Gumbo, we don't think about it. Uh, but. I suspect that there'll come a time where one of us is going to say, I've just had enough. But I've got no indication that we're ready to quit anytime soon. I'll chain my heart. Baby, let me go. I'll chain my heart. Cause you don't love me no more. Please set me free.